And then when I figured out that, oh, there's people out there that are just sitting on cash that are making six, 7% in their 401k and I can pay them eight to 10, then it got to be the point where like, if I had access to that money, I was going to find a deal to put it in. And so, uh, and, and I think that's why, how I went, that's how I went from like the three to four a year to the four, four to 15 a month is, um, is because I'm like, all right, that guy says he has half a million bucks. That's like five houses in my, in my market. So I'm going to go find five houses that are good deals. I'm going to flip those, make some money, give it back to him and then do it again. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. My guest today on Raising Private Money, he's actually raised $5 million of private money last year, and this year... He's on target to raise $10 million of private money for his real estate business. Imagine what you can do with this amount of private money burning a hole in your pocket. Well, what asset class does he focus on? He focuses on self-storage. And wow, if you are looking and interested in the passive way to make a lot of money, then you're going to love this show. We're going to talk about private money, how he raises private money very, very quickly, how he structures it. And then we're going to dive into how he actually does the self-storage business. Well, he's got over 10 years of investing experience and asset development, so he's got a lot to share. Well, now, prior to becoming CEO of Balcomi Capital, he was the CEO of the largest privately owned distressed house buying company in the state of Texas known as Texas Trust Home Buyers. He was buying all, he, he bought over 400 single family homes within a five year period. He developed and implemented the company strategy along with directing the asset acquisition and the management of those assets. In addition to his real estate investing experience, he and his wife have founded a private school focused on entrepreneurship. In just a moment, you're going to meet my good friend and fellow Mastermind member, Travis Balkum, right after this. Well, Travis, you have got a lot of experience in raising private money. In this show, in this episode, I want us to first talk about your experience, how you raise private money, how you find private money lenders your talking points and et cetera. And then I want us to move over into the asset class that you just really, really love, which is self-storage and how all that works together. But first, I'd love to hear, what did your real estate investing business look like prior to getting involved in the world of private money and raising private money? Oh, yeah. Uh, so for eight years from 2012 to, or I guess six years, 2012 to 2018, we were primarily residential home buyers. We'd buy houses uh, through local banks. We had large lines of credits through local banks. We'd, we were buying in 49 different cities, uh, in, all in the state of Texas. Um, we had some private money. Uh, we had one or two gentlemen that would kind of had a line of credit of about two million bucks that we would always keep active. Uh, keep active. I mean, we were always needing that money. Uh, we'd sell a deal and put it right into the next deal. So they never sat on their money too long. Uh, but you know, all, all good things come to the end for the most part. By, by 2018, uh, a lot of the uh, distressed houses had kind of dried up. We had bought over 400 houses during, during that six year period. And uh, essentially I, I was massively burned out of buying houses. And so I ended up, we had a, a cash crisis where we needed to raise about 150 grand easy money to raise i could have done it but i just chose not to raise it because i was so tired and so sick of buying houses i was tired of smelling foreclosures i was tired of dealing with homeowners who thought they had a you know crown jewel of a house and it was really just a piece of poop and so i just uh, i ended up shutting it down in october of 2018 i remember we were at um one of the mastermind meetings you and i are actually in two uh, masterminds together. Um, and I remember you telling me the story of just getting burned out, uh, you know, on that end of the business. Now, 
Travis, my guess is that you probably had something come along in your business that triggered you to really start focusing and raising private money. I know what my trigger was. I had my lines of credit at the bank from 2003 to 2009. And like overnight, I lost my lines of credit because of the global financial crisis that was going on. Uh, what got you started or actually what happened in your business that you really started focusing on private money? Or is it because you primarily changed the asset class? It was it was a little bit of of the of of kind of the similar thing that you had to deal with. I was uh, I, this my first bank, local bank lent me my first lent me the money on my first deal, gave me very favorable terms. Uh, in a month, I had to rent it rented out. I went back to that bank and said, "Hey, I want to buy another house." And they're like, "Well, we kind of need to we kind of need to make sure this house is going to work out before we lend you any more money here." And then. I was like, well, do you have someone that could lend me? Is there another bank you could refer me to? So he referred me to another bank. And that happened about three to four times. But then I couldn't find another bank that wanted to lend me any money. I had four houses with debt. I had somewhere like half a million dollars of debt. And, uh, you know, the value was 800000 or seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. So I had plenty of equity, but I didn't have actually any cash in the bank. That's when I was like, I was a realtor at the time. I was showing this guy or this couple of some property. And I just, I remember him saying that his dad or his father-in-law had made some money, like uh, sold a business, something like that, had some cash. So I was like, hey, man, you think your dad, you think he would lend me money? Like 30, I just need like 40 grand for this house. It's a real small house. I can get his money back in six months. You think he could do that at like, you know, 8% or something like that? And he goes, ah, you know, I'll ask him. And so he asked, we ended up getting on, a, on a, a phone call together. And sure enough, he did that. And so like all of a sudden I opened up a completely different world that I didn't know exist. I'd always been afraid of hard money lenders because they were 12 and a half, 13% with three points. I was like, man, I just, that just seems expensive. I'm borrowing money from this local bank here at five. Uh, and then this, this super nice gentleman who was really excited about partnering with me because he's, he's always wanted to do real estate. He, uh, he's lending me money at eight. And so this is great. And so uh, that kind of opened up a, a new kind of era in my business. I was buying like three or four houses a month, or excuse me, three or four houses a year. And it got to the point where I was, with private money, I was able to buy three or four houses a month. And and then that turned into like 10, 12, 15 houses a month. So that, yes, <clears throat> that is what happened. Yeah, well, and the story you just shared emphasizes the point in this world of private money that you and I are talking about and that you and I work in. We're talking about borrowing money from individuals, from human beings. We're not talking about institutional money. You know, you just mentioned um, hard money. So we're not talking about borrowing money from hard money lenders, but we're talking about doing business with individuals. So as far as it goes with, with doing business with individuals, how did it feel, Travis? I mean, you just said you were doing three to four houses a, a, a year and then private money uh, got you quickly to where you could do three to four houses a month. How did it feel when you were actually able to like break through and finally realize that private money was the main thing that you were missing in your business? And then when you got it, look how much it scaled your business like overnight. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely did. Uh, the I say that the difference was I had a pretty good income as I was a realtor. With doing three to four a year and then when i figured out that oh there's people out there that are just sitting on cash that are making six seven percent in their 401k and i can pay them eight to ten then it got to be the point where like if i had access to that money i was going to find a deal to put it in and so uh and, and i think that's why how i went that's how i went from like the three to four a year to the four four to fifteen a month is um is because I'm like, all right, that guy says he has half a million bucks. That's like five houses in my in my market. So I'm going to go find five houses that are good deals. I'm going to flip those, make some money, give it back to him, and then do it again. And so it was always this, like, I, I, I went from a, stand, or a, a philosophy of, like, here's some deals that I can do to this is, if that guy's money is available, there I, I think in the atmosphere out there in the universe, quantum physics here, that there's a deal that that money needs to go to, and I'm going to go find it. And so I just, my, my lifestyle and my, my business exploded in a good way for a very long time. I got the same experience, Travis, when we lost our line of credit at the bank. Uh, I mean, this was in 2009. And of course, we remember what was going on in 2007, 8, and 9. 
uh, with the global financial crisis. Well, we had all those foreclosures that were coming onto the market back then as well. Banks wouldn't loan money out. You had to have the money. And so now I learn about private money. Uh, I mean, it was a necessity if I was going to stay in business. And so now I was able to attract $2,150,000 in less than 90 days when I put on my teacher hat and just started teaching people that I have a relationship with what private money is and what self-directed IRAs are. And isn't it, isn't it interesting in a market that was like, you know, just crashing that first 12 months that I knew about private money, uh, our business tripled, tripled because we had access to the money. And isn't that funny? The more private money you have available, it just seems like the more offers that you make, right? Absolutely. It's a very empowering source of uh, power. So um, it's, you know, when you have it, you, you, you're, you're not, I wouldn't say bulletproof, but you have the capability of doing things that other people won't, won't do. In 2020, when things dried up similarly for like two months, I still had the relationships I had. And so we ended up buying quite a bit of houses just in those two months, even though we weren't house buyers. I'm like, yeah, wholesalers were calling me that were typically wanting like 110, 115. Like, man, well, I'll give you this thing for 93 grand if you want to buy it. I just want to stick this old lady with this house. I'm like, done deal. Let's do it. So I we, love yeah. it. I love it. So <clears throat> what's your, and, I'm, and the list is long, but what is your favorite reason or reasons for using private money versus hard money? And before you answer the question, go ahead and define for the sake of our audience, the difference between hard money and private money. And then what are your favorite reasons for private money? I know what mine are. Yeah, I would, I would say I would define private money as an individual who has cash to lend to you in exchange for a first lien deed of trust or a second lien deed of trust. And then I would, I would define hard money lending as private equity or institutional backed high risk leveraged debt um, with a lot less comfort in my opinion there's a there's a hybrid which is what i i borrowed a ton of money from and it's like the guy who his parents gave him three million bucks and he lends that money and then he uses a line of credit at a bank to uh, lend even more money that guy i mean the person i'm referring to we are still very good friends we chat once a quarter even though i don't you know i don't use his money anymore because i don't buy houses anymore right right so um so private money for me, the list is long. It, uh, you know, it put me in control of my business, put me in the driver's seat. You know, when I'm teaching individuals what private money is and how they can get high rates of return safely and securely, you know, I put the program together. It's more or less not a negotiable program. You know, when I was borrowing money at the banks and mortgage companies, they made the rules. You know, the old mindset of borrowing money as you go into the bank and you get on your hands and knees and put your hands underneath your chin. You go, please fund my deal. You know, please fund my deal. But, you know, in this world, Travis, that you and I are in, um, we're not asking for a mortgage. We're actually offering a mortgage. So, you know, you put on your teacher hat. You know, I practice and teach all the time, Travis. The money comes first. I know you've heard it. I've heard it a hundred times. Some people say, oh, just go get the deal under contract. And the money will show up. And I go, where? Where's the money going to show up, right? I, it just doesn't make any sense to me, unless you're wholesaling only and you've got a long list of, you know, real estate investors that can take, uh, you know, a deal down. So um, I, I want us to, I really want us to have some conversation about self-storage and et cetera. But let's give a gift away first to anyone that wants to get a fast start on private money. I have a recent money guide that I just finished writing called Seven Reasons Why Private Money Will Skyrocket Your Real Estate Business and Help You Build Incredible Wealth. If you want to get on the fast track to getting private money for your real estate deals, you can download this absolutely for free at www.jayconner.com forward slash money guide. That's J Connor, J A Y C O N N E R dot com forward slash money guide for the fast track to private money. So, Travis, uh, how long ago did you start migrating to self storage and why? Well, uh, well, yeah, in October 2018, I, I ended up closing my 
operations down. We still owned a lot of houses. Actually, in fact, that company owned over 110 houses, 42 renovations, and 72 rental properties that weren't doing well. <laughs> so let's just say that. And um, you know, I, I, as previously mentioned, I had a we had a cash issue. I closed my business down or closed my operations down, and I went. I took my money, or I mean, I took all my files, and I started trying to organize a situation that was kind of out of control. And so after about 24 months, I was able to get out of that uh, situation. However, like 12 months in, I'm like, I'm going to be able to get out of this. This is good. I thought I was going to have to file bankruptcy. I didn't think I was going to have to get out of it. Or I didn't think I was going to be able to get out of it. But, you know, if you just wake up and you just do what you're supposed to do and you tell people that this is my this is my plan, this is how I'm going to get your money back, this is how I'm going to, uh, you know, get out of the situation I've got into then it, it's amazing that if you just take it a day at a time, eventually you will you will be out of those situations you got yourself into. Um, and so as I was coming out of that, I was like, I've got to pick an asset class that for me is less operational intense. So on a house flipping property, you're making 58 to 110 decisions just to get that house ready to sell. And then you're hoping a real estate agent will bring someone that will have an emotional experience at your house and will say yes to it. And I just needed to get out of that. I didn't want to compete with the Uber drivers on the, on the, well, this guy's offered me this much. This guy's offered me this. I didn't want to compete with the wholesalers or the teachers or people that are doing this part time. I wanted to play a way bigger game. And I also wanted to play a way bigger game in an asset class that had a historical default rate of under 1% even in 2008. Uh, and so I was like, what asset class is that? And as I was figuring that out, that was storage. And so I read all the books on storage facilities on Amazon, which there were only three. And then I, I just basically absorbed all the information I can, could. And then I texted a few buddies and say, hey, do you know anybody in this asset class? Do you know anybody in this asset class? I'm trying to connect and, and learn all I can about this. This is where I'm headed next. And that was really kind of the reason why I got into storage. It was because housing did not provide uh, the amount of equity and amount of wealth accumulation that I wanted to because a house is only worth the same amount as the house next door because an appraiser appraises it as a comparison approach. So if a house next door is worth 300 grand, there's a good chance your house is going to be worth somewhere around 300 grand. But a storage facility is based, they value it based off of an income approach on a cap rate or a yield uh, basis. And so you could have two storage facilities right next to each other, but one of them is making 150 grand net every year and one of them is making 85 grand net every year the one that's making 150 grand is going to be worth substantially more than the one that's only make, making 85 grand a year which by the way if you if you come to that scenario the one that's worth only making 85 grand if it's the same square feet you probably should buy that one because because you can make more money because the one next door is making 150 grand but that's essentially why i i switched over it was kind of just like I need to not have as many plates spinning in the air. And I feel like when you're flipping 10, 12 houses a year or a month, you're spinning a lot of plates. You have to have a huge organization. You know, we had 300 utility bills at one point with all, all of our water, electricity, gas, and all of our flips, all of our rental properties. Uh, just way too much of an operational suck than what I wanted. I wanted something that was very, very simple uh, so that I could go mountain biking and not worry about Hey, is, is something catastrophically happening that I'm not hearing about because I don't have my phone on me? Makes a lot of sense. So um, the benefits, when well, you just started talking about it, the benefits of self-storage and this asset class, um, it's much less stressful, it sounds like, on the operations of it because not nearly as many decisions to be made. So, uh, so it's much more passive. Right. For sure. So uh, what are your so in a moment, we'll move into talking about how do you structure the financing when you're raising money and how are you raising money for these storage facilities? But what do you look for in a self-storage? And I, I assume you're buying and investing in existing self-storage and not building new self-storage facilities or are you? Yeah, we're we're actually about to, we're raising capital right now as we speak um, for our first large uh, ground up self storage facility. We've done a few expansions, you know, twenty thousand square feet expansions, thirty thousand square feet expansions, but we're building a ground up one. It's a piece of grass, piece of grass right now, and uh, we're building that um, from the ground up. Extra space is going to manage it, and extra space is the second largest 
storage facility owner in America. Mm-hmm. And they'll probably end up buying it once we, we, we get it stabilized. That t- tends to be something that they do. Um, but generally speaking, all the ones that we've done previously have been purchases with uh, an intent to add square feet to or with an intent to expand them. So what do you look for in deciding that you want to invest in an existing storage facility? And what is your typical exit strategy? Yeah, there's a, there's a few things you look at on the facility level. Um, it, it, it's But the most important thing to look at is actually the five or the four mile radius of where that facility is. You want to count all the other storage facilities up. You want to see how they're performing. You got to call them, secret shop, say, hey, um, hey, do you have a ten? You have five ten by tens available. If you, and if they're like, oh yeah, we got plenty available, then you know that the demand isn't that strong. But if they're if they were said you're like, we got nothing, everything's full, and you find that kind of be to be the the case around all the whole four mile radius, then you probably have a lot of demand of storage in that area, and you're just you you need to buy a facility because you at that point you know you can expand it and there's plenty of, of room for demand and you also increase your rents. Um, and so it's kind of a one, two punch. You win in both ways, but yeah, you're always looking for, uh, de- the demand, uh, facility level wise, you're looking, making sure like things like, uh, you know, you got the right doors, you got the right unit mix, you got the right gate size. You know, if you have a gate that's 12 feet wide, you're going to have a hard time getting a 24 foot, uh, U-Haul trailer or, you know, uh, van inside there. Uh, so you want bigger gates. You need to have an, typically have an office. Um, we want, uh, every facility we own either needs to have uh, cameras in lights, or if they don't, we need to be able to be able to put them in there and we need to get compensated for, for doing that uh, typically by offering them a little bit less than what they're wanting. <clears throat> I got you. Um, so how do you structure the financing for these um, self storage units? Yeah, so these are big purchases, two million to six million. The ground up one we're doing is uh, we're getting a thirteen million dollar loan on it, and so uh, we typically set seventy five twenty five loans. So that means seventy five percent of it comes from the bank, twenty five percent of it comes from limited partners or private lenders uh, that they're pri- private lenders that have equity. Uh, they have equ- they own equity in the facility as well. And then we raise 12 months of mortgage payments, regardless if it's um, if it's a stable facility, meaning it has 90% occupancy. We raise 12 months of mortgage payments just in case for a rainy day or something were to happen. Then um, if it's a ground up storage facility, we actually raise 36 months of, of mortgage payments because it's going to take 12 months or 12 to 14 months to build, then 24 months to fill up, and then we'll then it'll be, then the facility will be paying its mortgage at that point. Uh, in addition to that, we charge fees on top of those things. Those fees are typically three to five percent, based off of what we are doing and how how we're structuring the deal. Oh, and then equity-wise, um, the general—it's typically a general partner, limited partner setup. The general partner it gets uh, forty to sixty percent of the ownership, and then the limited partners get forty to sixty percent of the the inverse, the sixty to forty percent of the ownership. Uh, however, with that said, we make sure that our limited partners get their money back before we get before the general partner, which is me and my my partners, uh, get any any cash distributions. So when you're out uh, attracting and raising private money for these type projects, um, where do you find your private lenders, and how do they learn about the opportunity? Other than on Jay Connor's podcast, yeah, well, that's that's the biggest source of of. Uh, <laughs> Private lenders. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, you know, we, we we just are getting our name out there. We've got a social media channel. We've got um, some articles written about our company. We're doing a lot of podcasts. Uh, but you know, thankfully, be, being in the business for ten years, I've made a reputation for myself of being a guy that you can trust with your money. And so we um, we borrow money from attorneys. We borrow money from dentists. Uh, they're what's considered accredited investors, so they make at least two hundred thousand dollars. With a net worth of a million dollars, uh, not including their primary residence, and yeah, we so we grocery store owners, business owners, uh, financial advisors, all of those people we're sourcing capital from. But primarily, the normally it's it's uh, it's business owners are probably the number one place that we borrow or that we get money from. Uh, primarily because they want they realize real estate is an incredible vehicle of generating wealth, but they don't have the time because they're running their HVAC company or they're running their 
their credit union software company or they're, you know, they're, you know, running their grocery stores. And so it's, it's, they don't have time or to invest in real estate or at least learn how to invest in real estate. So they trust us with their money. What is uh, your minimum investment for someone to get involved and, you know, invest in your uh, capital company? Yeah, it's normally, uh, you know, 50 grand is, is kind of our base minimum. It gets, we, we don't offer a preferred return at 50 grand, which is basically a return that you get reg- before the equity distribution gets paid out before that us, the G- general partners get paid. So I would say 50 grand, but there's a lot more incentives for uh, the 250 grand and, and up. The preferred returns are better typically. And then you can partner. If you don't have 250 grand, you can get a couple of your buddies or three of your buddies and and uh, create an LLC, put money in there and, and invest 250 grand in our next deal. That's totally acceptable. So, so collectively, you're making a better return. What uh, typically, Travis, uh, what kind of returns can your investors typically expect to get? Yeah, our, the preferred returns, which again is that return you get before anyone else gets a, a payment. Um, you know, that's anywhere from four to 10%. Uh, I, I would say the average is 7%. And uh, the 10% is for like a million bucks plus, that sort of thing. So most people are giving us 250 to 500 grand at a time. That's a six to 7% return. Uh, in, in addition to that, if you remove the preferred return and just uh, have a five year uh, investment strategy, you're going to be getting your money back somewhere between, between 14 months and 28 months. And then you're going to be, we're going to be selling that asset within five years, which is where you typically make a, a two extra return on your money. So you'll probably make six to eight percent, six to eight percent return on your money every year. And then at that, and then when we sell it, that's where that two X comes. That's awesome. Well, I can speak from experience. Um, I have known you for quite a few years now, Travis. Um, you're one of the most trustworthy people I know. Ethical. You take care of other people. You've got a servant's heart. You know how to run a business and you know how to treat people right. So <clears throat> I'm sure we've got some listeners uh, and or viewers here that would be interested in reaching out with you and having a conversation. So what's the best way for uh, my audience to get in touch with Travis Balkum? Yeah, you can you can reach out on our website. It's investinstoragedeals.com. And uh, if you want to uh, reach out and just talk to me directly. You can do that on Instagram at Travis underscore Bauckham, B-A-U-C-O-M. Awesome. So that website again is www.investinstoragedeals.com. And um, Travis will be right there ready to talk to you. Travis, parting comments. I, I don't have any. I, I appreciate you. I've enjoyed this. I've appreciated you having me on. Absolutely. Travis, thank you for taking the time to join me here on Raising Private Money. And there you have it, my friend, another episode, amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Be sure, and if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any more of the upcoming amazing Tap those three dots and click follow me. And we really appreciate the five-star reviews. Look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Here's to taking your business to the next level. We'll see you right here on the next show. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.